Good morning. It's today is Wednesday, March 23rd. Uh, this morning we are looking at uh, Bill S269, the Energy Savings Account Pilot Program. Uh, we don't have the bill in committee. It is actually on the floor. But given the interest in this committee on energy issues, um, we wanted to be better informed before we proceed to the votes on the floor. So with that, we're uh, getting a, a little tutorial on the, the bill, and um, we'll start with a bill walkthrough from Council, please. Mr. Kalki, good morning. If you could walk us through um, the this is finance, um, the, as recommended out of finance, and the Brock Amendment as well. Appreciate that. Sure. Good morning. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, as the chair just mentioned, I'm here to talk about S269. Um, it is not yet posted to your website, but Jude is working on it. So um, the draft that was passed out of um, Senate Finance was draft 3.1 of the strike all amendment. And there is a, a floor amendment that's being proposed. So I um, am going to put them up on the screen. And hopefully it will be on the website momentarily so you can follow along. Um, but let me just get this. Okay. So Great. the so S269 is an act relating to extending the energy savings account partnership pilot program. Uh, the, the partnership pilot program. Uh, was established in session law in 2018. Uh, it was part of Act 150. And it established a pilot program that was supposed to run from July 1, 2019 to June 30th of 2022. Um, and what this bill is going to do is extend that um, because there were some extenuating circumstances and the pilot uh, is there, there's been a request to extend the pilot to continue gathering data and allowing the participants to finish the projects. So that is what this bill is going to do. To take a step back uh, quickly, what we're talking about primarily here is energy efficiency and the use of energy efficiency funds. Um, so all of you are familiar with the energy efficiency charge that is assessed against um, all customers uh, currently. Most customers have an EEC charge on their electric bill every month, um, and those uh, funds then go to the electric efficiency utilities to fund efficiency work throughout the state. However, there are two other programs. There's the SMEEP program and the ESA program. So SMEEP is the Self-Managed Energy Efficiency Program. That program is for the two largest um, energy users in the state. They um, instead of paying a charge every month, have a set amount in statute that they need to pay, uh, to, that they need to devote to doing energy efficiency projects in their uh, facilities. The other program is the Energy Savings Account Program, and that is for large commercial customers uh, who pay at least $5,000 a year in uh, energy efficiency charge funds. And that uh, participants can opt into that program. They pay the charge into a savings account, and then they can draw the funds out of that account um, up to about 70% of the funds, and they can then self-direct the use of those funds on energy efficiency projects. So um, currently, though, there's only one participant in that program, and there has been some discussion that this program isn't um, working as well as it was intended to. It's not attracting participants. So uh, four years ago, uh, this, this concept was developed to create this, this pilot program uh, that would take the energy savings account model um, and modify it slightly and, and use um, some participants to see if uh, there would be there, there were some positive changes that could be made to this energy savings account program um, that would be a ben more beneficial model. And so that's how this pilot program was created. And so what this pilot does is it allows the participants who have been selected 
to pay their energy efficiency charge into an energy savings account. They then can use up to 100% of those funds um, on a, a variety of energy efficiency projects within their facilities. Um, so the two key differences between the, the existing energy savings account program that's in statute and the pilot is that the participants can use up to 100% of their funds. And then also the list of types of projects, um, it's, it's a bigger list for the project, uh, for the pilot program. It's um, much more variety of things that they can do um, than is just contemplated under the original program. So that's the basic introduction. <clears throat> Does anyone have questions before I turn to the language? Uh, we're all set, thank you. Okay. So what the bill does is amend this, the session law provision that established the pilot program. Um, and so first it strikes the reference to this being a three-year pilot. Um, Oh, so, so the pilot started. The PUC um, uh, went through the, the process to issue an order establishing the rules and the, um, the customer selection. And uh, so they did that. There, was, there were nine participants selected for, the, for this pilot. Um, they began their work, um, but the, the PUC didn't finalize the rules um, until later than was possibly expected. Um, the program was supposed to run from July 1, 2019 to uh, 2022 to get a three-year span, but there was a delay in the PUC issuing the rules as well as um, getting all the customers set up. And um, it really didn't get started until early 2020. And then, um, well, you know, 2020 happened and there were some additional delays caused by um, labor shortage, material shortage. So there have been some delays in addition to the programs. Um, there, there have been some outside circumstances as well as a delay in the beginning of the program in general. So this bill is going to extend the length of the pilot. So first we strike the reference to the pilot being for lasting three years. Um, and then there is new language um, added to clarify what this extension is. Um, and so this is on page three of the, the draft 3.1 as passed by Senate Finance. Um, however, there is this amendment from Senator Brock. Um, and I think I should probably just go over that because Senator Brock, uh, in talking with the stakeholders, um, my language here is not as clear as it could be. So the language that's proposed in Senator Brock's amendment is to just clarify what's here. Um, and so Senator Brock's amendment would strike the new language, subsections four and five, to read. The pilot created pursuant to this section shall be extended an additional 18 months until December 31st, 2023. The commission shall allow the current participants in the pilot to decline to participate in this extension by submitting written notice to the commission on or before June 30th, 2022. So this is giving an additional 18 months uh, to the pilot. Um, the, the nine participants can opt to not continue with this extension if they want, and they can submit written notice to the PUC. But otherwise, they'll continue to accrue their energy efficiency funds for an additional 18 months. Subsection 5 says, the participants selected for the pilot may request an additional extension until uh, December 31st, 2026. The extension shall allow pilot participants to spend or contract to spend pilot funds accrued prior to January 1, 2024 but shall not allow participants to accrue additional pilot funds. The commission shall consider requests and shall approve all reasonable, uh, reasonable extension requests. So what this is setting up is allowing the nine participants, those that have already been selected, to continue to accrue funds an additional 18 months 
so that they will have accrued four and a half years worth of energy savings funds, energy efficiency funds to use on efficiency projects. They then have until um, up to December 31st, 2026 to spend uh, the funds on the energy efficiency projects. And so this bill is not modifying the other elements of the, the pilot. And so there will still be um, the uh, evaluation and recommendations um, from the, the Public Utility Commission. Um, they're gonna, they themselves, or they're gonna, they're gonna either hire a third party or they're going to do themselves um, uh, a verification <clears throat> and evaluation of the projects and um, then the PUC is going to write a, a recommendation report um, on how the pilot went. And so that isn't changing. Um, this, the original pilot did contain this provision that there are annual reports. And so that will continue um, through the life of the extension as well. And, um, and uh, the other change though that the Senate finance made is that the commission should not submit its report on its recommendations until after um, all of the projects have been completed, hopefully. And so that will not be until July 1, 2027. So that's when the PUC will report back on its um, recommendations. And then finally, there's section two was added in Senate finance, um, creating this working group um, so the working group is gonna be made up of the Department of Public Service um, with the participants that were selected um, to participate in the pilot, Efficiency Vermont, uh, Secretary of Commerce and Community Development or designee, and the current participant in the existing statutory energy savings account program. Um, so they're gonna um, convene a working group in August 1st, 2022 and then they will report back to the General Assembly by January 1st, 2023 on their recommendations with changes to the energy savings account program. And the bill shall take effect on passage. Great, um, thank you very much. So let me pause. Uh, any questions from the committee for council? Thank you for that very helpful summary and walkthrough. Um, with that, I'd like to go to. Um, all right, I need to print in my list a little too small. Um, Deputy Secretary Brooks, good morning. Um, so I think we'd, we'd love to hear from you about your perspective on the, the program. Sure. Why? while you're participating, et cetera, what your hopes are for it. Yeah, uh, good morning, Chairman and uh, committee members. For the record, my name is Tate Brooks. I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, so I think a good place to start, uh, Mr. Chairman, is probably uh, last fall when uh, the agency started to uh, conduct outreach to the nine pilot participants to get a sense as to you know, how things were working for them, uh, understand, understanding the conclusion of the pilot program coming at the end of June of this year. And the feedback was pretty consistent across the board in that one, um, while it was a three-year pilot as, uh, as you know, projected, um, in statute, it really was kind of condensed down to two years because of the time uh, that, it, that, it, that it really kind of took the PUC uh, to kind of put the rule together and put the rule in place and, and get uh, necessary feedback on that front. So they felt kind of, uh, you know, truncated on, on that level. And then, um, as Ellen kind of made reference to, uh, you know, February slash March of 2020 happened, COVID happened. Um, and so they were experiencing issues with COVID and labor and supply chain issues. And, uh, you know, the companies indicated again to us, the Agency of Commerce, that uh, some of the transformational prog uh, um, projects that they kind of had envisioned were unlikely um, 
going to be able to to move forward with just because you know June was coming uh, very very quickly of uh, of this year, you know. So at that point in time, uh, we started having some discussions with both the Public Service Department and Efficiency Vermont to see you know what uh, potentially could be done to try to you know I think go back to the original intent of the language and look at a, a pilot program to see you know. How could things potentially work different? Um, are there potentially transformational projects that could be, you know, a win-win-win for everybody, a win for the company, a win for the people of Vermont, um, a win regards to uh, uh, efficiency? And so um, during those conversations, that's where we kind of came to a, a, an agreement, um, which more or less is kind of reflected in uh, the language that you see in front of you today. And um, I guess with that, I'm Happy to take any questions or turn it over to some of the other uh, list of speakers who may be able to fill in some some areas there for you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, any committee questions for Secretary Brooks? Right. Um, I have one. Could you talk a little bit about the working group and uh, you know establish the working group? What what's the role of the working group going for? Yeah, um, I'm happy to touch upon it again. I think it would be helpful for the committee to hear from both TJ and, and David on that. But um, as Ellen kind of indicated earlier, there is an existing ESA program in place, but you know, frankly, it's really underutilized. There's only one entity the, in the entire state of Vermont that uses it. So you know, as we watch and have conversations with the pilot um, participants, uh, get that feedback, uh, potentially get feedback from a report, um, uh, from the PUC, uh, we thought it would be helpful to kind of keep <clears throat> moving the ball down the court here uh, this fall with a working group and have the ability to, to report back to you all about some potential changes for the permanent ESA program um, uh, starting potentially next year. So that was the thought on that. Thank you very much. Um, anything else you want to share with the committee before we go on to Mr. Four? I think that's good for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ford. Good to see you again. Um, what would you like the committee about uh, uh, the program? Yeah, I'll just add briefly. Well, um, Mr. Brooks started last year. I'll go back even further to three years ago when when this was being discussed the first time, and and really why why was this pilot? past, right? You're taking um, electric energy efficiency funds and using them for potential other types of projects or including energy efficiency funds. And um, really, there was a couple of reasons. I think there was a, there was, uh, a number of companies who had felt like that they had done a lot of electric efficiency improvements and uh, more able to continue to capitalize on the um, uh, on the services of Efficiency Vermont uh, in, in their own facilities. Um, and then, and so they wanted to not just get, get out of the energy efficiency charge, but also, but try and use it for a broader, broader set of efficiency programs. Um, and that would include, um, you know, the discussion at that time was not just uh, electric efficiency, but thermal efficiency, and then um, looking at the benefits of, uh, of these types of investments on job creation and retention, also the energy savings and energy cost impacts to their building, energy productivity, and then the amount of ca actual capital that they, those companies are applying and leveraging. And so um, I, I raise that because that kind of circles back to the question you asked about the, the working group and really the type of evaluation that needs to be done. So with the energy savings account pilot, the department is tasked like it is with Efficiency Vermont and like it is with our distribution utilities in tier three for verifying the, the savings and the projects that actually get implemented. And so there's only been a small amount of projects so far, but we can look um, at those projects and then look prospectively at what's in energy management plans and see and do the comparison of, um, you know, what is the, what is the effect of this pilot um, on the, um, 
uh, on the participants on uh, the electric system. So the electric system results for the pilot program and then really compare that to the electric system results that might have been obtained but for this program. And I think that was really the, the test that this pilot, um, you know, I, I wasn't actually at the department when this was getting established, but as I understand it, that this was the test that um, this pilot was um, exploring, right? Can we still get these, can we still get benefits in this other mechanism? Um, and I think that's really what the working group is going to explore a little bit. There'll be a little bit more information, although not full information because all the po projects won't have been done. And then to try and explore, well, is there a permanent program that, that works and balances kind of that impact to ratepayers as a whole and these participants? And um, the working group would come in January and, and um, you know, let, let you all know the results. And um, maybe that the, the standard energy savings account program is fine how it is legislatively, doesn't need legislative fix and just needs to be tweaked within the commission process. Or maybe there are some legislative fixes that are needed. And so that's why I have a January due date for that. And so um, I think I'll stop there um, and see if there's, uh, there's questions there. Um, any questions for Mr. Ford? Any? Um, I have one, and that is, can you talk a little bit about um, the notion of sort of broadening the definition of efficiency for qualifying projects? For instance, this committee did, I think the number was 237 two years ago. Well, I'm not sure that it's two years ago. Roughly two years ago, we, we said we were going to uh, pilot $2 million a year out of the energy efficiency charge fund to look uh, to pilot projects in the thermal and transportation spaces. Um, and so in a way, this reminds me of that kind of broader view of what we might mean by efficiency. I, I think one of the things we've talked about in here, I don't think we, we haven't formally transformed programs, but the notion of shifting efficiency from pure kilowatt hour savings to um, being able to address the fundamental driver of climate change, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I don't know all the reasons that people are proposing pilots, but anyway, can you talk about this evolving concept of efficiency? Yeah, and I, I think you've you've heard from the department um, over the years that you know electric ratepayers um, we we should be wary of cross subsidies and having electric ratepayers kind of be the uh, tool to cure all our social ills and to um, cross subsidize uh, efficiency savings in other sectors. Um, so it, the that. That said, that this um, I think this is exactly how you described it. It is a test, and to see what those benefits really are for this subset of customers. If we're if those customers have already explored all their electric efficiency savings available at their facility, then um, what else can they do to um, to impact their energy use, their energy costs? Or energy productivity, uh, and then what kind of benefits does that have um, it, in terms of um, greenhouse gases, potentially broader economic impacts, and then what kind of cost does that have? What are you um, what are you losing in terms of those broad electric system benefits, and um, you know what is that impact? And we we talk pretty regularly about wanting to keep our electric costs down. Um, because we want to encourage the economic proposition for people and companies to switch to electricity um, because it, it can be more cost effective, um, more efficient as a whole uh, in, in terms of e whole energy use and um, more um, uh, and better for the environment um, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, we want to really be cautious about um, uh, about those types of cross subsidies, but this is um, 
this is a pilot for a certain set of customers to see if there is that benefit for kind of the broader societal look and then what the impact is on ratepayers is um, you know some of the projects that they're doing are still electric projects and the benefit to those customers is more in the in terms of having uh, easier access to the dollars and being able to sell these projects to their parent companies and saying hey you know, we have this money that we're definitely going to lose if we don't spend it on this efficiency project, whether it's electric or thermal. Um, we've definitely heard that feedback in the in the pilot process as a as a benefit of the, this pilot. So um, I don't have a. That was a really rambling way to say I don't have a definitive answer on kind of how this is how, how this evolves, but this is kind of a test to see. Um, see what the costs and benefits really are. And uh, the test got um, thwarted a little bit by the, the process to implement it and then the, um, and then the pandemic. Thank you. Um, is it possible that it could go as far afield as someone deciding to uh, transform their vehicle fleet from fossil fuels to electric vehicles? I don't know if anyone's proposed such a thing, but I mean, it, I'm just trying to see sort of how elastic that boundary is in terms of what projects might come forward. I, you know, I am not sure if transportation related projects are on the qualifying list. I may turn to Mr. Westman and to see if he knows the answer to that question. Well, certainly. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Dave Westman, uh, Director of Regulatory and State Agency Affairs for Efficiency Vermont. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, in reference to that question, Senator, it's not our understanding that the original language allowed for any transportation uh, uh, expenses under these funds. Uh, they're largely directed for um, either electric efficiency or thermal efficiency under the uh, alternative screening criteria that uh, Mr. Poor identified as well as for the critical business needs that were identified by the participants uh, as Mr. Brooks identified. So um, as of right now, transportation is not included in one of the allowed categories, but going back to the idea of the <clears throat> uh, working group that would be established by these amendments, um, I think that could very much become a discussion uh, among the participants because we do know that uh, the current energy savings account um, participant is interested in um, pursuing electric fleet opportunities. And so I think that that is definitely something that will be discussed and could be brought back uh, to your committee uh, in subsequent um, iterations or recommendations. But as of today, uh, it's not an allowed opportunity under this extension. Um, and we'll be talking more about it. Well, thank you. So before we go formally over to you, Mr. Westman, any uh, committee questions for Mr. Poor or Mr. Poor, any last remarks you wanna, something you wanted to make sure to share with the committee before we move on? No, I think that's covered everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Westman. So thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you for having me. I don't have a lot more to say uh, from what my colleagues at ACCD and the department have given you. From Efficiency Vermont perspective, um, we too want to see this pilot uh, be either a, a success or create uh, demonstrable savings for the participants and then to make recommendations to this committee. Uh, we too believe that this extension will allow for that opportunity to take place. So we have, um, we have great confidence that with the time that's being discussed, in these amendments, uh, we, can, we can do that. Uh, we also strongly support, as I just mentioned, the uh, idea of the uh, working group uh, because uh, we would like to see um, changes to that energy savings account program, uh, changes that would be both beneficial for uh, ratepayers uh, in terms of creating more savings uh, as well as for the participants. And I wanna reiterate what Mr. Poor said, that we did hear feedback that <clears throat> having the savings account as a dedicated pool, uh, a use it or lose it, if you will, resource 
can actually be of great value to um, large corporations, especially corporations that are out of state and have to compete uh, for other capital funding. And so I have seen this in other states uh, work to, for this exact same reason, which is that um, those use it or lose it uh, resources can be very compelling uh, to convince uh, an out of state corporate headquarters to make the investment here in Vermont um, that we're that we're looking for from from our participants. So um, it is in everyone's long term interest to, to have a successful and healthy uh, uh, energy savings account program. And I do hope that we'll be able to come back to you next year with some strong recommendations. Uh, Sarah McDonald, could you share with us what you believe that the assembled members of the working group would be who they would be? Well, I believe they would be um, Efficiency Vermont representatives from the department, representatives from all of the participating companies, uh, as well as the uh, current energy savings account uh, program participant. Is there, yeah, is there any doubt in your mind what they will report at the end of this experiment? Um, I think that, yeah, that's a fair question, Senator. And I, I, I don't know, actually. And I, and I think that we have heard enough <clears throat> um, specific uh, feedback that some find the access to the funds be, to be the most helpful. Some find the screening to be most helpful. And I think that that is, that is sort of the um, art of the, of the working group is to work through those differences and ultimately to find um, a common perspective that can be agreeable to all parties. I, thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. Weston, I, uh, I, you know, one of one of my jobs sometimes I think is to channel questions to to guests that I hear from other people. So, one question I've heard is, why would Efficiency Vermont, which would otherwise receive these monies into its regular energy efficiency program, uh, support a program that has you operate, you know, that, that sequesters those dollars and puts them into these projects at the nine different pilot facilities. Can you, can you speak to that point? I think that that is the idea of the energy savings account program as it, as it exists, which is to give access to um, the companies who contribute large sums of electric efficiency charge um, bill payments and to have a dedicated um, account that they can draw upon in a time delimited way uh, for the primary benefit of, as I, as I, as I explained, as, as witness poor explained, to bring to their corporate headquarters and say, hey, we, we've got to use this money. It's, 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 a, it's a strategic resource. Um, and so I, in my perspective, having those companies make those large capital investments in the state is not only an investment in our long-term resources, but also in the efficiency that creates long-term ratepayer benefits. And so I do think that that is, um, that is a subtle but notable difference between just the general energy efficiency funds, because in all candor, some of these companies do have difficulty um, getting their corporate headquarters to make those investments in their, in their capital and plant if they don't have these funds available. So that's really the, the premise, and we'd like to see that put to greater use. Sure. Um, you know, the, one of the simple ways I hear people talk about it is like, you can only change all your light bulbs once, then you start to run out of light bulbs to change. Can you say a little more about the um, kind of projects that you're seeing and what you're anticipating under the pilot? There are a wide variety of projects. Um, there are some lighting projects. There are some thermal projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have energy management uh, plans filed right now for the majority of the customers, which is a prerequisite, and they do stretch the stretch the field. Um, so we have seen some very innovative projects at, um, say, some large ski resorts, and we've also seen some 
companies identified critical uh, plant upgrades in the form of lighting. We've also seen, and um, Senate Finance uh, had uh, uh, Ms. Bombardier uh, speak to some of the strategic investments they made in uh, uh, pumps and you know critical infrastructure that's part of their manufacturing process. So um, I, I, I do think it stretches the sort of field. Uh, there's these companies use energy in a wide variety of ways, and uh, their energy management plans um, you know reflect that. Not all have been, um, not all of these projects have been uh, completed, obviously. That's, that's why we're going through with the extension. And um, as we have discussed in prior testimony, there may be additions to these energy management plans based on um, this extension and the additional accrual of funds. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, is there McDonald? Hey. The question about asking Efficiency Vermont whether it's a good idea, um, that's not their, we should not be asking Efficiency Vermont whether or not this is a good idea. We should be asking them whether they can do it and what's the upside and what's the downside. They're in the business of creating efficiency. And if you ask them if they should be hired to create efficiency, they're gonna say yes. Um, that's if, if you ask someone, a contractor that does cement, whether or not they can put cement here, there, or the next place, they will say yes, yes, and yes, because that's what they do. Um, the, there are so many messages being mixed in the testimony here today. You can change light bulbs twice, not once. And then having changed them twice, you can then install motion activators. So there are three places, three places, not one in electricity. And I only mention that because that those are facts. Um, when you take money from people to use it to do electric efficiency, which has brought Vermont electric rates from the highest to the next to lowest in New England. That's the purpose of the program. Any corporate board of directors would be delighted to save money on thermal or other non-electric uses if someone else pays for it. We should be finding someone and an entity to pay for the reductions that this program is reportedly experimenting with. You don't have to experiment with what we know the results are going to be. You have to find a funding source and you have to dedicate that funding source to the reductions. And we in the legislature have failed to do that. And we're going to spend three years getting a report the answer to which we already know without finding the money to do what needs to be done. And um, that's, you know, if I were a business that get, would get someone else to pay for my projects and be part of a working group that when the projects are all done to say, it was absolutely fantastic. You can't believe how much money we save without having to use our own money and without having to use, have a funding source that was lasting. I would say terrific. Three years of freebies. And at the end of the three years, we're just where we began with anyway, because we do not have a funding source. But we're in the, we're in the public sector and if a group of people come in and ask us for money to do something and we give it to them, you can't blame them for asking. Um, just put a record on the finance committee. The, um, I posed the bill to begin with a couple of years back. There's absolutely no reason why, because COVID has delayed this, that we shouldn't recognize COVID and simply move, the, move it back and give this experiment 
the time it needs to uh, complete it. Um, is there any, Mr. Chair, is there any additional money that has been sent to the, it's available to those operating this experiment that did not exist as a result of the COVID extension? Uh, are you referencing ARPA funds? I'm not sure. I the, the, my understanding was that the, those that are conducting the experiment could use the energy efficiency money that no longer goes to electric energy efficiency. And that was three years worth of money or no more than X amount. Um, has that three years worth of money been made longer by virtue of the extension? Yes, 18 months. And what's the dollar figure for that? Well, it's capped at um, $2 million a year. So that would be $3 million statutorily as a maximum, I think. Uh, I'm going to look at Mr. Weston to correct me if I'm off track here. Uh, or Mr. Ford. So the, the participants that are in the program, uh, their efficiency charge contributions um, were about totaled about $1.3 million. So um, it didn't reach that $2 million cap. So the, the conceptually, you were right, Chairman, but the, um, it's 1.3 times eight, for 18 months. So about $2 million. So the, the net amount of money hasn't increased as a result. I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I think you're agreeing with you that the net amount of, I think you referred to them as contributions, have not increased as a result of this this bill. So the the extension would allow um, another uh, about two million dollars to accrue for those participants, as I understand it. So the 18 months extends kind of the accrual. Uh, gives them more money to spend um, and uh, it, as well as the extension of time. So there is more money to spend as a result of this extension. That's correct. Okay. And it's one thing to extend a three-year program for reasons that are reasonable to toss in another couple million bucks. Don't blame those of you who ask for request the amount of money, I blame us for giving an additional contribution of two million bucks from someone else's from, a, from someone else who can no longer can't use it, who it was originally designed to be used. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I didn't, I wasn't sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Well, just so the committee knows, <clears throat> the finance committee um, voted I think six one to. Uh, Prove it. So, just so you'll know what's already sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm, I'm not expecting this committee to go against the finance committee. I just no. want to make make sure we understand what's oh, going on. Sure. Um, I would, sure. you know, I, I, in order to be accurate about the characterization, I don't quite know that it's entirely fair to call it somebody else's money. It's money that they would have paid into the program. That now, instead of just letting Efficiency Vermont determine, in actually in partnership with them, because they have consultants that work with larger companies, they have like account managers, is my understanding. That this is that they're going to have a, a higher level of control over what kinds of projects are hmm. done and that what's allowable is expanded. Yes. So still could be energy, still could be electrical yes. energy, but could also be thermal. If they are will be permitted to use the money for, for things that were not lawfully, it could not lawfully be used. And the ratepayers who pay the money in were the ones who were exclusively had opportunities to apply to reduce their own electric rates. And Efficiency Vermont made recommendations on where all the ratepayers could get the best bang for their buck to reduce the rates paid by everybody. Everybody was in there together. And now um, this experiment allows certain people 
not to participate in the what was the law called for and to use money that would have gone to other people for their own purposes. And they will report when this is over that it was a fantastic idea and they could not be more pleased at how much money they have saved without having to invest their own money. Well, this their own money thing, I think, I'm not quite sure why you keep saying it that way. It is their own money. The question is, is, what, is what are the community benefits out of these programs versus the traditional program? Because it is, they, they won't, is, is my understanding, well, so this is the experiment. As I understand it, we're looking to say what's the not only the benefit of the, the company implementing the measures, but there are going to be broader measure, broader benefits. For instance, what if you're reducing fossil fuel use or you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions? What if you are reducing your overall electric load? So you're still backing off load to the benefit of everyone on the system. And they are nine experiments all being run. And I also don't think it's quite fair to say we know what the report will say. Uh, it's a bit unfair to those who are going to work on it, analyze it, and write the report. I, I We don't know, because some measures of the nine may turn out to be winners, and others might not pass. Uh, so the screen might evolve, for instance, because we say that can deliver enough of a benefit. So uh, I'm just trying to be open-minded about the what we're actually examining. Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, first of all, a, a little bit of an, an apology. I, I was not involved in the creation, except on the floor, but I mean, in terms of committee, I'm new to this committee, newly returned to this committee, this uh, session. Um, when we're discussing, for example, an analogy, when we're on the floor and we're discussing an amendment to a bill, occasionally someone will lose track of where we are in the conversation and we'll rise and start to address the bill itself. And then they'll be told, no, 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 we're on the amendment. So too on this, this bill is, is not all that ambitious as I understand it. It changes the timing in an existing program. But I would like to go back just a little bit from my own orientation to fully understand, to better understand the underlying program and to put the question in, in very much the novice terms. What good things will happen as a result of this program that weren't going to happen anyway? And what good things that were going to happen won't because of this program? Um, good question. So, so um, do we hear the things from the witnesses that won't happen as a result of this program? Sure, I, I think so. Let's turn to both Mr. Westman and Mr. Poor um, because uh, they they know the projects in uh, far greater detail, and uh, the department does that neutral analysis. So that I think is right on point for what. Uh, Senator McCormick brought up. So I don't know which of you would prefer to go first. I'll defer to my colleague at the department, Witness Poor, because I do believe that this comes down to the department's evaluation of how were these projects um, successful? How was this pilot successful in developing projects for Vermont? Yeah. Um... Thanks for the question. I um, so <clears throat> the what that question is exactly what the working group I think is uh, in the report is intended to um, evaluate. The so what good things will happen? We already mentioned one thing of it, companies at least saying that they're able to leverage more capital, and so that capital. Um, you know, their investments of kind of that use it or lose it money, um, they are able to use it and say, hey, now this project is a, you know, 18 month payback, let's, let's go for it. And then they've leveraged kind of this other additional investment. 
And the, the comparison is, okay, what did we lose for that investment? Um, Efficiency Vermont, if they had the money, would have spent, uh, spent it on, you know, perhaps some programs there at that facility or other facilities across the state and what kind of investments would they have ma- made? And we can use their, you know, their results from their business existing facilities program um, and kind of look at some of their programs that are maybe even more similar to the measures that, uh, that these ESA pilot participants uh, um, invested in and say, okay, well, if Efficiency Vermont was able to make this happen, maybe they gave a 50% incentive for this. And so they leveraged 50% of that capital investment. And the question is, well, what, you know, what was, uh, which program leveraged more in this three years? We'll we'll be able to hopefully be able to kind of answer that question. Um, You know, what, what kind of system benefits um, would have been accrued by Efficiency Vermont? So the reduction in peak, for instance, they get, you know, on average, their existing facilities program gets a certain amount of KW per um, dollar invested in the efficiency charge. Well, what was that? Uh, And then that benefit flows to all ratepayers, as Senator McDonald, I think, was making, making that point. Well, what is the what is the um, what does that metric show in the ESA pilot participants? And um, it's not going to be zero. There's some uh, electric efficiency investments there. Um, we don't know what it is today, but this evaluation will help us um, help us understand that. And that really, that's those are the types of things we're going to do that with energy, just total energy savings, um, greenhouse gas emissions. We have we we um, have uh, we're going to try to evaluate job creation and retention. Um, that one is is a little nebulous and challenging, so I don't, I'm not committing to kind of crystal clear results there. Um, but um, we you know types of evaluation that we could do there, are like interviews, to help determine the jobs created and retained from these investments. Um, and then estimate the indirect job creation. And those don't just happen with the ESA pilot participants, it happens with Efficiency Vermont investments, but again, we kind of look at it. And all of this in information to try to say, okay, we wanna be done with pilots and have a program, an energy savings account program or whatever we call it for customers that that is fair to all customers and that works for them in order to make the most, uh, get the most benefit for, uh, for Vermont and Vermonters. And so, um, so it's, a, it's a very good question, Senator McCormick. I, I think that's, that's what we're, we're trying to get at here. Thank you. So I think Senator McCormick, you also asked what investments will no longer yeah, be what- available. What good things are not going to happen as a result? Because the money's gone someplace else. Right. Well, those are the those are the ones that the efficiency Vermont would have made investments otherwise. That's what I, I was trying to articulate with that is that they would have otherwise um, it made investments as long as the commission dedicated the same budget. And those are the investments that we want to we want to compare what that would have borne out to what the energy savings accounts pilots. Or out, and those investments are the they're more. I think they would be more. I know they would be more on the electric efficiency side of um, the house. If well, um, so you're taking electric efficiency investments and doing electric and thermal and transformational type investments, combined heat and power, for example, and then um, so it is expanding the scope of those dollars and. Uh, and making those investments there. And so that's that's the balance and the trade-off. I can pro- provide a little bit of detail. Um, these funds would generally be directed towards our commercial and industrial programs uh, for existing buildings. Those programs are largely dominated by lighting projects. 
HVAC projects and uh, fans, motors, pumps. So as uh, uh, Mr. Poor just said, those are all electric efficiency uh, type of projects, but of the more industrial sort. Um, I guess one more question. Uh, Senator McDonald, if I understood it correctly, uh, made the, the point that this is a study, uh, a pursuit of information that we um, actually already have that we can predict with some accuracy what the what what it is we're going to discover is that accurate yeah, oh, yeah. well I, um I, anytime i predict something it always seems to be wrong um but i uh, <laughs> uh it uh you know, I, I guess I'm not sure what this is going to hold. I think we're going to we're going to know that there's less electric uh, investment, or I, I think uh, that there will be less electric investment. But um, you know, it, it, it's all about trade-offs. I think you know, um, are the is the balance of what you're getting for that less electric investment worth it for this this uh, for the state and for the um, uh, and for the companies that are participating, um, I think uh, it, the answer that we know is yes. Under the current design, it's probably worth it for the companies that are participating. The question is: is that um, where? How do those benefits accrue back to the state? Um, what what they're getting out of it, and how does that compare with what we would have otherwise done? Oh, thank you. Thank I'd you. like to check on the budget side of this, just to double check. Uh, I haven't seen a report just lately from Efficiency Vermont, but my understanding of the total energy efficiency charge dollars collected um, that are sent, remitted to EVT for support of the programs you run is about 50 million, or maybe it's a little less, 48, somewhere in there. Um, I wanted to check that number. So if we're talking 1.3 million, we're somewhere in the 2% range or less. Is that about right? I think the elect, I think 50 million is roughly the total with the um, in investment in uh, efficiency Vermont, including the thermal efficiency and process fuels budgets. So it's it's probably around 43 million. Um, Mr. Westman probably has that on the top of his head. Uh, for for electric efficiency, it's a little lower. So, no, I agree with that characterization. Just trying to put it in scale. Senator um, McDonald, a question I've asked three years ago. I asked earlier this session. Um, the question is, how much does it cost per kilowatt hour to save electricity? The um, Several years ago, you could save electricity at three dollars a kilowatt hour, and then it was you know three and a quarter bucks, and you know getting up to around four. Um, what is the current price of saving electricity through efficiency measures? Uh, I don't have the exact. Um, cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, Mr. Westman probably does. I would say it's about four cents, but. Uh. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And we think about that in lots of different perspectives, actually, uh, Senator. Uh, a program like a commercial and industrial electric efficiency prod program might have a specific, you know, we think about it in $300 per megawatt hour, roughly, give or take. Um, some very low hanging fruit type lighting replacement projects can get down into the $200 to $250 per megawatt hour of savings. They are quite cost effective. Um, however, we do have a number of programs that um, go into a totally different market segment, segment like um, say energy efficient appliances or uh, new construction activities. So those can get up into the $500 or $600 uh, per megawatt hour 
price range. So really, because it's such a broad and diverse portfolio, we have a um, we have a number of different um, numbers. But broadly speaking, we do try to fall portfolio wide somewhere within that four hundred dollar per megawatt hour range. And when you purchase electricity twenty four seven, what do you, what's the price of purchasing? That one I will defer to the department on. Uh, well, you get when you purchase electricity, it depends on what you're purchasing. If you're um, purchasing just energy, um, you know it. It depends on the month, the time of year, on average. Twenty four seven, twelve months a year. What's the price? Yeah, the average is around. Uh, it, it also fluctuates, but late, over the past several years, it's been between three and four cents a kilowatt hour just for the energy. You're also getting you, that's not counting um, capacity benefits that you get. So capacity is on a per kW. You, know, you also have to purchase capacity, which is a um, you know something you get with efficiency. Uh, the the energy at the time of peak, right? Um, the regional peak. And so that has been anywhere from, uh, it, you know, the, the metrics are, are not easily kind of tacked on to one another because that's in a dollar per KW year metric of $2 to, or per month, excuse me, from $2 to, to seven or even $9 uh, one year. And so um, how you trans translate that to a per kilowatt hour just depends on a lot of factors that I'm not prepared to do right here. But generally, I will say, you know, if you are, we're going to package it all, including renewable, uh, you know, rene avoided renewable energy credits that you need to purchase, et cetera, you're in the six, seven, eight cents a kilowatt hour range. So efficiency as a whole, on average, four cents. The products it delivers seven eight cents. So, um, Mr. Chair, just when you when the consumer buys electricity, sixty percent of the money the consumer pays is for the electricity, and those are rough numbers. The other forty percent it pays for poles and wires. And when you reduce the amount of electricity that you need you don't need new poles and wires. So when you're doing electric e efficiency and using less electricity, Vermont uses, is it correct? That Vermont uses less electricity today than it used 20 years ago. Yes, slightly, it's about the same than it was 20 years ago, yeah. Which means that there has been no need, substantial need, for increased poles and wires, which is 40% of your electric bill. If you can not use more electricity than you used to use, you don't have to spend 40%, that 40% for poles and wires. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, you've been more than patient. And the committee has also been more than patient. Um, if we were going to tackle thermal heat in the use of fossil fuels, we might use the electric efficiency system as a model. And the electric efficiency system started off with a modest, small fee on the cost of electricity built into the bill. If you wanted to start a robust experiment, partnership, pilot, whatever you want to call it, you would put, not you, we would put a small modest fee on fossil fuels. And then we would have a ramp up that would continue to increase that fees if they were saving substantial amounts of money. And this is no fault of the witnesses, but we of the Energy Committee have not recommended that, and we are afraid to recommend that to our colleagues. So instead, we are pilfering from a program that is successful and remains successful 
to um, have a study, the results of which I will bet anyone in this room that I can write the conclusions. So I will end and I thank the committee for their, uh, their patience. And I challenge all of us to tackle the use of fossil fuels, global warming, et cetera, that we are reticent to take on. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator McDonald. Well, we are, the clean heat standard was just referred to this committee on the floor yesterday. So we'll have a chance to look at fossil fuel use and we're using greenhouse gases driven by fossil fuel use. All right. So, Hallelujah. Yeah. Mr. Senator, Chair, again, this came to a, I mean, we don't have it. It's on the floor. No, uh, it's, it was referred to us yesterday. It was referred to us yesterday. Yes. Thank and you. I'm, so we do have it. I don't plan to make a harangue on the floor, but this committee, this is our responsibility. And we're, we need to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I do. But, yeah, yeah. And I didn't think it was. Thank you very much. Or, <laughs> so uh, this is our opportunity to, again, make any edits, any changes, amend, um, or vote favorably. Right, I mean, we didn't take possession, so we don't, we don't have... We didn't take pos possession, yeah. it was referred to us. Yeah. The came here will be dead. I'm talking about, sorry, the clean heat standard was referred No, Mr. To Chair, us. I'm talking about the bill that we're talking about oh, right now. No. It remains on the calendar. That's, thank, yeah. you. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was here, failed to meet crossover. Right. I just wanted to make sure when yeah. I said it, it had come to us, I was right. a little confused. So just, from a parliamentary point of view, please. Any senators allowed to make uh, a, a propose an amendment? Of course. Bill. Yeah. And so, uh, I, you know, if there are senators on this committee that would like to bring an amendment, then um, no, no, I, I, I so this will, but you, you are looking for a straw poll, or you're looking for something. Yeah. So I thought I, Thanks. you know, I, because this is an interest. Of a topic of mutual interest yeah. in two committees, even though we never ever received a bill. Uh, but this bill just monkeys with the timing. Right? Pardon me? This bill just addresses timing. It addresses timing, but by virtue of addressing timing, it also addresses the total amount of money accrued into this yeah. program. What I'm saying is, I think that they're really the underlying program is not in question here, it's an existing program. Correct. Yeah. Delayed by COVID for a year yeah, and a half, yeah, yeah. and given another year and a half, gotcha. count for that delay plus some extra money. So, as it's possible that uh, someone might ask, what's the the position of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee on yeah. the bill? I, it would be helpful for me to be able to report that if you know uh, have that information for the floor. So in an informal straw poll, then I would just ask um, how many members of this committee support the bill as currently offered? Uh, please raise your hand. Okay. And oppose? Okay. So- And thank you for the conversation. It was very helpful. And I am yeah. glad that we, we had it. Yeah. Very helpful. And my apologies to the committee for not being more vigilant about having the testimony in a more timely way, even though we weren't having the bill referred to us. So thank well, you. There's a lot of that for, for you know, raising the flag on it. On a perfect world of my own making, we would have actually had the bill in here. We would have had jurisdiction because it is an energy bill. Okay. Well, we should, we, energy bills should always come to the energy committee. And my, I, you, you just apologize, Mr. Chairman, but I'm, I'm a bit um, miffed with the leadership as well, the Senate leadership. Well, it's not unusual if the committee finds that bills, the folks that voted out of other committee on crossover date, and that having them come here would result in their having not that crossover. Yeah. Um, usually, it, it, uh, it happens with agriculture more often. That, that, yeah. that, that should be thought about earlier. And sometimes <laughs> with uh, economic development. Yep. Yeah. With an amazing coincidence, yep. they often arrive on the calendar and crossover day. Um, okay, so to all our guests, um, you've heard the discussion. Anyone who's uh, visiting with us today have any uh, remarks they want to share in closing? Uh, seeing none, hearing none. Thanks so much for coming in. It's very helpful to really help us uh, bone up on what's 
what's in the program. And uh, uh, I personally look forward to the report because I, I'm not sure what it's going to say yet, but I'm interested. All right. So thank you, everyone. And we are finished with uh, our discussion of S269. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, but you, Senator McCormick, has raised the question that I've had, I think, individual conversations with all of you, some more recent, some as long ago as one, two, or three years ago. And that is around the jurisdictional question of creative energy. Um, I've also talked to the pro tem over the weekend about this. And last year drafted a rewrite of Senate rules clarify the role of this committee versus finance when it comes to something with energy. To me, the connection is that so much energy policy is implemented by regulated utilities, and that committee oversees regulated utilities, that there's a natural connection there. But I would prefer to have only one policy committee, and oversight is very different than writing new bills and programs. And I think that's where we get wrapped around the axle. Uh, I'm going to the program's office. Well, years ago, uh, I think uh, Mark and Randy Brock and I spent the day together. We'd be in here in the morning and then we'd go to finance in the afternoon. And we would often hear from the same witnesses in the morning and then in the afternoon because um, at the, the big energy issue then at one time was uh, Vermont Yankee. It's right when Ember was falling down. <laughs> the cooling towers were yeah. on fire. Whatever. Yeah. And saying, and still insisting nothing can go wrong. But um, uh, my understanding at that time was that energy issues were uh, the purview of two committees. The two committees had jurisdiction because the energy committee has jurisdiction over energy and the finance committee has jurisdiction over uh, utilities. So energy utilities. Fund. And an analogy would be uh, corrections where judiciary committee has jurisdiction over program and the institutions committee has jurisdiction over bricks and mortar. Uh -huh. We are with the institutions as the committee that, that handles all the physical stuff of prisons. Well, it's not, it's not a bad thing because my experience being on finance and natural resources is you get a lot of testimony and then you go home and you sleep on it. And then when it gets to the next committee, you have three or four questions. That yeah. You, you developed after the day you got your original testimony. Yeah. And that's it's that secondary round of questions that is where you sort of learn the nitty gritty of it. And it's sort of like every bill in the, that comes before us at some point goes to appropriations. Right. And there's a little double jurisdiction there. And for 20 years, there have been two members of this committee, at least that served on finance every, every year for the last 20 years. Yeah. Perfect. But I, you know, so I remember it, for me, one of the more challenging instances of doing work on a bill, the RES, the Renewable Energy Standard, we worked on for part of, not all day, but a total of 26 committee days in the RES. Uh -huh. We went to finance and it was in there for four hours of testimony and 19 proposals for many. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So sometimes that, that was a little jar. Yeah. On afternoon money committee is a, a little more cloud. <laughs> and before we get to our next um, uh, issue, I wanted to ask, does any, you probably remember as the reporter, what was the floor vote on um, S201 second reading? It was, it was a voice vote. It was a voice vote. I don't know if I heard one or two no. slight dissent. Okay. Okay. So, Lake Hall? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was a vast improvement. And then people, I think, were voice vote, they're going to vote for it. Wait to see what happens in the mail and who contacts them before we took it up there. Yeah. Um, I also thought it was, it would be a kindness to our 
colleagues not to call for a roll call, just let it be. We had such a strong voice vote. Move it. And, uh, I was surprised that the Senate leadership did not ask that we not call for, we did not call for a roll call on the mascot bill, which is a, a different, uh, but uh, I, I was surprised that I had thought of asking for a roll call, then I said no, because I didn't want to, we have a couple of people who are going to vote for it, whose, jury, whose constituents would likely punish them. So, but uh, you you know, I thought that Becca would actually make so, sure that, you know, Senator Westman, can you say a little more about the, the notion of sort of getting a process underway to look at this question and other questions? Like, I think another one. Under the, the jurisdiction question? Yeah, broad definition of that could be brought up. I don't know how many well, we would put on the list. Of, I, you know, I personally think that um, we're at a point in time where we're a little behind the times. I don't think looking back in what the jurisdictional questions are is all that helpful at this point. Um, um, Senator McDonald has talked about how um, we've been able to reduce the pressure on the grid, but going forward, if we're going to move most of transportation over the next 15 years, to 20 years onto the grid and cars are going to be plugged in, we're going to increase in a way that I, I'm not sure that we are fully aware of right now. We're going to put more pressure on the grid. Without the, the share well, from ISO. Yeah. And, but it's going to put now we may be able to adjust that so most cars are on at night and this and that, but as you have cars, you can't control the way all people are going to use the grid. And if you're so it's it, it it's going to we we can have a vision about the way we want to direct. The grid is going to have more pressure. As someone that sat for six years on a utility company board. We had, we voted a little over a year ago to go to setting a date of 2030 as the date that we're going to go carbon free. We could have, and the question really came down, do we go carbon free, are we going to put all our, our um, how fast are we going to go carbon free versus becoming all renewable? If we put our efforts into being all renewable, then we would have gone carbon free a little later than 2030 in, in that balance. These are all becoming jurisdictional issues around that bump up with transportation. Here we bump up against finance. Our finance committee has so much going on that on a lot of the utility issues, I think they give it as much time as they can, but they don't go into the detail that a policy committee like natural resources is going on. So where in this, if we're going to have a big bulge of change in usage, where do we fit as a committee in that bumping up, given what the view of what's actually going to happen over the next 10 or 15 years? Where do we fit? And quite frankly, I'm afraid that if we sit here, we wait till next January when they name committees again and the committee on committee sits there and does it and we don't start that conversation now, when we get to that point in January, they're gonna name the committees and they'll say, well, we'll study that and then it'll be another two years before <laughs> anything happens again. So I think that there, 
it would be incumbent upon this committee because I think the issue of, for me, the biggest issue on the planet right now is how fast we can get to carbon free. And if there's going to be more pressure put on the grid, we're going to have to produce more power and how do we not produce more power and make sure it's not um, produced with a carbon. Or constraints. What? Or in the Shia, which is you're producing the, the carbon free stuff. You can't get it out. Well, you can't get it out. And because there's but, no share, but it's going to, get to it out. but it's also going to be if you have a lot of batteries on cars that are using stuff, you may be able to charge those batteries up within, you know, the Shia and and be more efficient. And where does um, where does battery storage in the um, utility sense fit in adjusting the grid to do? So these are all issues. Of, and I'm afraid that the finance committee, not through any ill intention, is so busy with so many other stuff, they can't focus on in any large scale the um, how do we increase the use of the grid, produce more electrical power to be able to fuel um, the transportation changes and, um, and do those issues justice? And, and would some of those issues be better planted in a natural resources committee? And then where do we bump up against transportation? <laughs> so should we, should we not, begin to think about those issues as a committee and raise them. Right, and I think you could add this pretty much the same story on with uh, all the programs that are transitioning, like our weatherization and thermal heat programs mm -hmm. to add in. Because I, I, for I, water I, and for space heating. Now, I, I will say, I, it, you, Joan and I were in Britain in October. And Ford Motor Company in Britain announced while we were there that Ford Motor Company by 2030 will not, will, is going to have all of their, every car that is sold in Britain will be electric. Well, if they're going to do that in Britain, I don't think we're going to be far behind. And, and the idea of using less power in the grid if that happens is is old thing because we can't we can't power the transportation system with the same amount of electricity that we're producing right now which is one of the reasons why you want to be even more efficient of the things that you but, currently use is that I, 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 I want to, I want to, minor, yeah. minor compared to one of the, when you weren't here the last two, the last session on the screen, mm -hmm. we had a devil of a time with Vermont Electric Co op who offered like 350 bucks for electric vehicles. And we're sitting here holding our heads, going, my God, you guys can't get electricity out of. Your Vermont Electric Co op area, you've got all these posts, poles, and wires to pay for, and you won't encourage electric cars to purchase this power that's being thrown away like milk being thrown out behind the barn. You have electric cars up there, you can, that will lower Vermont Electric Co op's bills. They'll be able to sell that renewable power. And the answer was, well, our, for our people, it's it's a cultural issue. And we go, my goodness, how do you do we meet exactly the things that the Richie's talking about, Senator Western's talking about, to use the power that they're making and spill it on the ground like they were throwing milk on the ground? And, we, and you don't get any ice of money to get power out of your neighborhood. You get a share to bring it in, but not to take it out. And just, you know, we can't, we aren't the, um, the committee with jurisdiction over um, 
utilities, but the utilities are going to be central to yeah. purchase of power that is carbon. We're supposed to be um, thinking about getting carbon out of the environment. Um, we can't talk about cars because they're in transportation. And, and so, so, where, so where are the lines? And with the world that's changing, should we not think about where those lines are? So I don't, I'm going to talk again. I mean, you're all welcome to do the same with uh, Pro 10 about, you know, what might we, well, I suppose it'd be good for us to talk for another two minutes before we go to Ms. Howard. But, um, I'm just thinking, how do we put together a proposal? It's always nice to be able to walk in and say, here's, here's our first cut at working on this. I don't know if there'd be like a, a working group, informal working group established in the Senate to look at the stuff. A lot of people are busy, but we'll have time between now and adjournment to have some conversations. If we don't have the conversation and we wait till next January, nothing will change. Uh, right. um, <clears throat> okay. So one hmm, seems like we would want to have Thanks, Rich. Uh, mm -hmm. a, con a conversation with the, the actually the full Senate. And then I can imagine them saying, well, okay, so that's too many people to work on it, but you might ask chairs to work on it or something like that. Although they're the ones who are apt to be most parochial. So I don't know, but also maybe most informed. So anyway, I just say if if it says utility on it, they send it to finance. And and the problem for me is if that utility company, and we have this flood of cars coming on, if that utility company to meet the demand, um, they fire up the natural gas plants in Connecticut because um, to fill that demand, we will have failed. What have we gained? Oh, yeah, I mean, to, to do what? EV to charge the cars. Yep, yeah, they're they're going to be charged at work or between midnight and five in the morning if we are smart and thoughtful. That's, if we, but yeah. if we if we figure out the policies yeah. to do the right thing, but you know some of that's some of how they'll be charged. But I can see people going, you know, I I just got to work. And I need my car, so I'm plugging it in. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and so uh, so unless the policies and somebody's thinking about all of that, um, do we come if we come out the other side of switching all cars to electric, and we lose ground in the grid? What have we done? <clears throat> yeah, we just sort of have our tailpipe is much further away. So they. they if all people charge their cars at home with their own convenience, then we need to expand getting electricity out. And the, the most folks have said you gotta worry about getting renewables out there to be available. But, okay. Great. Well, it took us almost two years of discussion on the Vermont Electric Board to get to a place where we said we're going to by 2030 go carbon free and the backup to that was that we were going to be all renewable by 2050 if we had put all of our energy into being carbon free with um, um with all renewables we probably could have done it by 2040 or someplace in the, um, the early 40s, but we made the decision that it was more important to go carbon free. But in that same sort of a discussion, how do we have that sort of discussion to understand those and build those policies in, uh, in the Senate? Okay, all right, so thank you for that. Uh, Helping key up the subject. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, again, I don't need to be the only one to do this, but 
I'm going to check in again with the corner office and see about thinking at a think, finding developing a process that we implement while we're still here in the building. Maybe it spills into the summer, who knows? But I agree, we'll we will be uh, dead ducks if we wait till uh, January to have a conversation. Oh, uh, with that, so we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, and that is S234 and relating to changes to Act 250, which is on the calendar. Um, there is a section. Uh, Ms. Howard, would you like to join us at the table? Thank you for coming back in. Since we uh, you, we talked with you quite a bit and many other folks uh, around the whole notion of affordability and long-term affordability and while we have this once in a lifetime uh, surge of ARPA money, um, could we uh, have Vermonters benefit by having more of that, uh, more housing that was affordable for a longer period of time? And that's the language we put into the Act of 50 bill. Um, since that time, I've you know, talked with you and others and learned that. Uh, however well intentioned the proposal is, that it causes some complications that uh, it sounds like that throw a bit of a spanner in the works in terms of changing the review process and the funding mechanisms associated with affordable housing, particularly priority housing projects. So I would just like to check in with you and ask you to help with that maybe so that we better understand uh, I guess the, the implications of that section, and uh, I'll, I'll be direct about it. Uh, I've had second thoughts, uh, you know, well intentioned, but I'm not sure it's, I think that it actually could have unintended negative consequences. So I'm contemplating talking with the committee about removing that section before we would have a third reading of the bill. Yeah. Um, so that's the question I have on my mind. Would it be useful to develop the kind of housing we're talking about to remove that section of the bill because of the other things going on in housing? So it's as transparent okay. as I could be. <laughs> uh, Jen Holler, I'm the policy director with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and I um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, and also, really appreciate the intent around this provision we was able to listen in remotely when the committee was thinking about it and added it towards the end of your consideration of your version of 234. Um, and at that time, one or two of you also said, if there are things we should be thinking about this or more we should know, we welcome people to let us know. So um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna take that opportunity and just uh, explain a little bit about how VHCB funds ARPA funded housing projects. And I think what I'm hoping that you take away from what I'm going to be able to share with you is that your intent is being met in terms of having deep affordability when those federal resources are being used for housing. Um, and I do think it would be good to consider um, maybe not including that provision in the bill when it goes um, out of the Senate because I think it may create an additional um, administrative step that may not be necessary and may actually slow down projects, which I don't think is your, I don't think was your intent. So, um, so that's the key point is that the housing projects being funded with ARPA through the Vermont Housing Conservation Board meet or exceed the new threshold established by the committee and um, with that amendment to 234. And this is true for both nonprofit and privately developed housing projects. Um, so another way of thinking about that. So the HCB is receiving ARPA funding, a substantial amount of ARPA funding from the state to advance affordable housing projects. To my knowledge, um, our funding, our use of the ARPA funding is the only ARPA funded housing development happening in the state that would trigger Act 250. So um, the information that I'm able to provide should cover that universe for um, and well, another key point is that, so we, I think when I testified it once, I showed you this thick final treasury rule <laughs> that, um, that sets out how you can use ARPA funding. And then 
the next layer down from that in terms of how we can use the funds was established by the legislature when they appropriated, when you appropriated or allocated our funding to BHCB and you said you shall focus it on primarily on, on serving those who are experiencing homelessness, but also mixed income housing projects. So there was that sort of priority placed on it. And then under the next step is that we enter into a grant agreement with the state. They send the money to us and then we give it to projects. So there are all, and then also our board established guidelines, our policies around um, what kinds of projects are eligible and what, um, uh, what the funding criteria would be and what the affordability thresholds would be. So essentially, what our board is requiring whenever they provide our funding to a housing developer um, are affordability thresholds that are more deeply affordable than what you have included in S234. So your intent would be met in that way. Um, so to talk about it in a little more detail, for all the housing projects that receive ARPA funding, affordability for at least 80% of the units is at 80% of the area median income. And we go further to say approximately a third of those units are restricted at 50% of the area median income. And another step further to say, Specific, a specific number of units, and that can vary a little bit, are specifically dedicated to those experiencing homeless, homelessness. So, the, and all those affordability restrictions are permanent, with the exception of the homeless piece. They, the developer can come to us in a few years when we hope the homelessness problem is much less than it is, and they can ask us if they can just keep those affordable, but not necessarily dedicated to people who are homeless. If they're homeless, hopefully there are no homeless folks at that point for them um, to have them. So in the nonprofit projects, nearly all the units are affordable and a few are at market rates, that 80 to 120 kind of moderate income, middle income um, uh, household range. And in private developments, and that's because the mission of the nonprofit housing developers is to do affordable housing. So nearly all the units in the projects they bring forward are affordable. They, again, they may include a few at market rate to create a truly mixed income um, uh, building or neighborhood. And also because we know that there's a lot of need in that area as well. So in private developments, projects that are advanced by private developers, that can vary. In some of them, they want to do most of them as affordable. And in other instances, they've got a large project and they just want to make a portion of it affordable. So for any of the units or apartments that were, <laughs> those have to meet the affordability requirements I just mentioned. Um, there may be instances where there's a larger development um, and we're funding just a portion of it. That portion is affordable. Uh, but there will be other unrestricted units in that uh, development. But in that instance, it wouldn't it wouldn't be primarily funded by ARPA, so it still works within the definition that you um, that you mentioned. So I can stop there, and then I can give you a few specifics in terms of the number of projects we've done, how many are PHPs, and that sort of thing to help you with the context. As a beginner's question, so VHCB um, partner with both private and nonprofit. Projects. Yes. Well, we um, over the course of our, our history, we have largely partnered with the Affordable Housing Nonprofit Network because that's their mission and they're set up to do permanent affordability. With um, federal funding that we administer, the private developers are eligible as well. Um, and what we do is we require, and the private developers honestly don't always like this. Um, when we provide funding, even the federal funding, we require them to hold those. Apartments permanently affordable as well. Right. Well, permanent is much longer than our 30 year threshold. So. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's why he's the chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Chair, if I may, yes. so we're looking, uh, and I'm sorry, I was with the pro tem. Uh, we we're looking to pop for an amendment, correct? Is that what we're possibly considering well, here? Yeah. And I apologize for not being here at the beginning. No, to be completely direct about it, because of you know, I love smoke and mirrors, but direct is great too. Learned through all this information, and since that since we passed it, whatever it was, three four weeks ago, um, that for 
we're getting the results we're yeah. looking for yeah. without throwing some sort yeah. of new wrinkle into the process. For yeah. instance, the NRB came to me and said, you know, we don't have a process to evaluate the funding streams like this. We'd have to set something up to, to make sure that anyone who was going to come in into that program would actually be primarily uh, ARPA funded, for instance. And so they said, so Jeff for them was just another processing step that, and they said, it's yeah. not helpful, especially that they're already under pressure and that the VHCB our programs are actually going to surpass what you're doing. So I said, oh, well, if I'd known all that, maybe we would never put that in. So the post I'm thinking is before third read, actually third read before second, before read, that we could remove our prior housing project section because it's addressed elsewhere. Okay. So, thank you. Um, you had some sp specifics. You I do, but I don't know if the committee needs or wants them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and I have to apologize because I have to go upstairs to where scheduled take a break at 10 15. At 10 15, I need to go to the house to testify. Um, so, any committee questions for Ms. Howard? So, Senator McDowell has a question, and I may miss the, the answer about the percentages of different kinds of housing projects. Like, you know, how many different programs deliver what percentage of the whole housing pie? Oh, okay. Often the housing oh, people interesting. speak a, a yes. language of their own, and we, we, do. don't, we don't. We do. We call it a capital stack, but I mean, we should call it a capital apply. Um, <laughs> and I think that it, uh, the different funding sources do, I mean, the proportion does vary substantially. Um, but you're right. I mean, it, that so there can often be three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, different funding sources. But if there's a dollar that comes from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, we would require it to be permanently affordable as a long term policy. Um, uh, that policy is also embraced by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency when they put in low income housing tax credits. So there's two or three different funding sources that we could have to analyze and support policy when we don't know the relationship yeah. 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 where yes. the different monies are. So to get to the point today is that we have applied that criteria or that requirement to the ARPA funding that we are administering. Which is what percentage of the fire? Uh, again, it can vary from a project from like you know, uh, 20 for 15 or 20 percent of an overall project to up to as much as 75 or 80. Be nice, oh, that's a big variation. Be yes. nice to see that. So, when witness is testifying, we can say, Ah, it's they're talking about this slice or this slice or whatever. So we have mm -hmm. some perspective. I could provide you with a list of the projects we funded so far and, and how much ARPA is consists of each of those projects. 